The scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 7, 24 to 27, and it is the New Living Translation. Anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. Here ends the lesson. To God. So uh, it's my really great privilege to welcome among us, uh, I mentioned their names earlier in the service, but now I want to say a little bit more. Uh, Peggy Shepherd, Peggy M. Shepherd, uh, from the organization We Act for Environmental Justice. And that is interestingly an organization which this congregation supported something like five years ago or something like that. Uh, I remember we were thinking of doing things together, which never really happened because, uh, but it's happening. <laughs> so that's a marvelous thing. And uh, so welcome, welcome very much here. And of course, also Paul Galley, uh, for who, whom we know was with us uh, before uh, as a director of river keepers, am I right? Yeah, and uh, now uh, is a fellow, or uh, what is the exact title, at the Columbia Climate School. And uh, it is, that is exactly the theme we want to talk about. And I was looking for the biblical passage which will kind of help to illuminate that <laughs> at some direction. And came up this, uh, parable uh, from the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus' uh, teaching uh, about those two builders. And of course, we see it all the time on the television, those houses kind of collapsing over the dunes or something like that into the sea. Uh, and one thinks, oh, what a silliness building on, on and but those are usually very rich people uh, very often, uh, especially uh, in some areas. But I think that these days the situation is different, at least partly. Uh, because, uh, yes, uh, frontage towards ocean or rivers is usually highly priced, but very often also there are areas of floods or flood plains, or like Jamaica Bay, where there are people living and probably will not be living any much longer. Uh, I think that we chatted about it, that there is a chance. And other places where it is not a choice of that builder, you know, or an, an rich community, uh, or those who can build up tall protections but that they have no other option to live in exposed areas to pollution, to substandard housing, if they have housing at all. Unfortunately, in big cities, that's the concern as well. And then exposed to environmental crises. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, what is your, personal perspective on it. If what, what can you share with us? Uh, and I see Paul indicating to Peggy, so, and I will give you a microphone, um, just making sure that we have you on, uh, on for those who are uh, online. Uh, yeah, you, you can talk and talk to me if you want to talk to a person or talk to the congregation as you wish. Well, again, hi. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my perspective comes from working uh, with communities that have been the most affected by pollution and by disinvestment. And so I've been working within the environmental justice movement for the past 30 some years, working with hundreds of grassroots groups around this country, um, all fighting similar issues, although they certainly differ uh, according to region. Uh, you know, we don't have the petrochemical and oil refinery companies fence line with our homes uh, the way some people do in Houston, Texas, or in Baton Rouge or Louisiana. Um, we may not have some of the pipeline issues that some of the tribal nations have. Uh, because we have zoning, unlike Texas and uh, Los Angeles, California, uh, where there's no zoning, a cement factory can locate right next to your, to your backyard with your child, you know, on their swings and sliding board. That's the way some communities are living around this country. But I began organizing uh, just up the street a bit uh, in Harlem. You know, I live uh, up on 140th Street, uh, right across from City College. I'm sure most of you know where the college is. And so when I moved there, there were issues uh, that were happening around air quality uh, from sewage treatment plant, air quality from buses, because uptown neighborhoods house over one third of the entire New York City fleet. And so, Air quality became the issue I began organizing around with my community uh, residents. And what I realized was that you want to focus on the people most affected by the problem because those people have the lived experience and they also have the understanding to help resolve some of those challenges. And so my perspective, just to kind of conclude here, my perspective is community organizing, organizing the people most affected, giving them the training to understand the science behind some of these issues so that they can better educate their elected officials, go out and testify at hearings, and really be part of the civic fabric of the city where decision making is made. And so again, um, we welcome all of you. Um, to, to become a member, to, to be engaged uh, on these issues that are so impacting all of us here in New York City. It's just that it impacts some of us in some communities more than others, but we're all impacted by poor air quality, by greenhouse gases, by the, the extreme weather impacts of climate change. And so we all have to be part of that solution and we all have to be uh, change makers. So um, I'll stop there and I know Paul will talk about uh, his perspective on these issues. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you all of you for inviting me. And uh, interestingly, uh, my journey uh, has gone through some different uh, spaces, but I think ends up at the very same place as Peggy's. And uh, I was trained as an attorney. I've been an environmental attorney, an activist. I'm a researcher now at Columbia University. And I worked for 13 years for New York State government in a law enforcement role, enforcing the environmental laws. And that was quite uh, wonderful in terms of learning how to try to get justice. And uh, justice is there for the taking, if you work hard enough for it and smart enough for it, is what I learned. Uh, I then went into land conservation for a decade and then 11 years as the um, president of Hudson River Keeper, which is a clean water and safe energy group dedicated to our area and has spawned a movement of over 350 other keepers around the world. And after 11 years of doing that and, and in 
empowering communities and fighting things like hydrofracking and, and seeing, as Peggy and I were discussing, just how successful you can be if, if you're dedicated and if you're thoughtful and if you uh, don't lose hope and if you act on that hope. Um, I, I decided to leave Riverkeeper and, and seek to have that organization have uh, revitalization and new leadership and uh, while I still could, uh, moved to Columbia University to build on the educational work that I had done. But to come back to where Peggy left off, uh, Peggy said two very important things. You've got to center communities in decision making because there are two types of expertise. There's the types of expertise you get by becoming an engineer and designing projects or becoming a lawyer or becoming a biochemist. And then there's the expertise you have from being part of a community that has a level of knowledge and wisdom without which you cannot develop good plans for protecting our communities against the challenges that we face and that will get even larger. And to the very last point that Peggy made, I feel as if even those of us who have built our house as well are now on sand as well. I think climate change makes us all vulnerable in ways that we cannot be uh, high and mighty about no matter how well built our structures. And we have to realize that even if our houses are well built, there are houses that are poorly built through no fault of those others who built them and that our success and their success are intertwined. And uh, you, you, you know, just listening to you and uh, talking so very nicely and powerfully about communities. I want to challenge you here a little bit or ask your wisdom here because it's very nice to, 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 to really engage community, but too often I saw actually the community of rich solving their problems by shifting it to the neighbors who could not afford, say, uh, help or something like that. So how to, how to build this solidarity across the communities? Now I am picking up from my experience uh, of flood-stricken Binghamton, which has unfortunately been in the news recently, but uh, you know, Binghamton built flood walls but it dammed the river, and the river upstream flooded those um, other communities around. And, you know, is there a, some, some wisdom there? Of course, I think that there is a role for churches in that area also, you know, advocating and helping organizations advocating for this solidarity. But are there good examples of that, or is there something we can help with, uh, or something like that? Well, some years ago, um, St. Mary's Episcopal Church, uh, which is uh, it's on 126th Street uh, on the west side of Harlem, um, there was a man named Father Castle, and he organized a coalition called Harlem Valley Churches. And it included all of the sort of Episcopal and Catholic churches um, sort of above 96th Street going up to, to Washington Heights Inwood. And they came together around an agenda of, of drug-free zones around schools. Um, they were very active in the whole um, issues around air quality and pollution that, that my organization, We Act, was engaged in. Uh, they came together um, around uh, you know, crime in the community. So it was really a, a coalition of churches that also included groups like mine uh, in the neighborhood uh, that really wanted to, to mess message the kinds of, of, uh, of issues and concerns that they thought we should all galvanize around. And so how we come together across neighborhoods, across ideologies, is by creating coalitions and collaborations uh, around uh, a particular outcome that we can all commit to 
and agree to and provide resources to. And so most of the, the policy and practice change that uh, certainly Paul and I have been working uh, to achieve for years uh, comes about through making policy change. But we've got to have all of you to do that. And I think we see the green groups, you know, the big national green groups that you all have heard of, Sierra Club and NRDC and EDF and all of those large national green groups, Nature Conservancy. Um, we see them now developing diversity strategies within their organizations. You see them now uh, really talking about environmental justice in uh, a more concrete way, not just giving lip service, but working, struggling to figure out how they can be uh, you know, part of the support for environmental justice communities and how we can all come together to advocate for strong climate policies because they are realizing that without everyone, we cannot make the changes we need. And we could already see that. We don't have Build Back Better, which was going to have billions, trillions, for climate investments and environmental quality investments, economic investments that we all need. Because as we transition from a fossil-free uh, economy, to a more transformational one, our energy bills are going to increase you know, in the short term. What does that mean for low wealth communities, low income households, where we already have one and a half million households in New York City who cannot pay their utility bills? Over 30 million households around the country are in that situation. And of course, the COVID pandemic has made it, it worse. So thinking about how we come together as faith leaders, uh, with community, um, across sectors, because we need everybody. We need the community gardeners. We need the transit folks. You know, we need the air quality folks. We need scientists and academics and communities working together. And it's not that hard for us to come together around some very identified outcomes. And we need to do more of that if we're gonna create change because we see that our opponents to the change we need are very organized, very organized, yet we are not. And so that is why we are not winning on this issue and we won't win until we come together in a stronger, more robust way. I, I agree so deeply. And I would say that uh, we have two main challenges, which you all understand. We have to reduce the amount of fossil fuel-based energy that's used and get it down to what they say is net zero. And we have to do that sincerely and not through uh, words that don't get followed up with action. And we also have to prepare communities and strengthen communities for the disruption <clears throat> that we can't avoid. The number that I'm going to give you for the expected sea level rise here in New York by 2050 may shock you, but it's predicted to be at least uh, a foot and possibly as much as two feet by 2050. That is 30 years from now, less than 30 years from now. And when you first hear that number, and some of you are hearing it for the first time, I imagine, you probably say, well, you know, that's, that's just not possible. Uh, I wish. So we have some real challenges to come that are being worked on by a lot of very dedicated folks in a lot of different agencies, the Army Corps of Engineers, the City Department of Environmental Protection, the State Department of Environmental Conservation, where I once worked, and to this theme of partnership. These plans that are going to come out of those agencies will either be done with the community, designed with the community, or they will be done for the community without real voice from the community having shaped those plans. And as you can imagine, 
I feel strongly that the plans will be better if they are done with the community. Not only will they take into account what's really going on in communities, not only will be they designed in ways where communities feel they have a stake in those plans and will support those plans and help implement those plans, but they'll just be better and wiser. You don't build just what the agency wants, you don't build just what the community wants, you come together and figure out the right answer together. So this idea of partnership is so essential and it's at the core of what I've helped to put together at Columbia as part of this new climate school called the Resilient Coastal Communities Project where we have a strong partnership with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance and uh, they've helped us curate uh, 10 uh, different sets of community interviews where we've asked communities, have you been involved in coastal planning? What's your experience been? How should the planning process change and what resources do you need? Peggy talked about how we need to fund community organizations the way the big green groups are funded and the way all the other groups from the mainstream are funded. Because ultimately, if we are successful, it'll all be part of the mainstream. We'll be working together in a way that we've never worked together before. And there are a number of projects in mind for that, Justice 40 and the, the New York Climate Leadership Action Council, uh, efforts at New York City uh, around a climate knowledge exchange. People are trying to mainstream this question of environmental justice and it couldn't come fast enough. So um, I'm um, really happy to hear about the core of your work being community organizing and on the grassroots level. I guess my question is, if there were one, one issue that you would claim for everything is important, and sometimes we get overwhelmed by that. You know, what, you know, picking and choosing, and do we dilute our efforts when we're worrying about everything, right? We need to worry about everything, but politically, it seems to me that if churches and community groups, and community groups, small community groups as well as large ones, could hit on one issue, that they would be a kind of a wedge issue, beginning with our community boards and our uh, mayor, our, our city administration, that we could all get behind, what would it be? One, one dream project you would <laughs> like to, project. that was my thinking, you, uh, <laughs> we were thinking the same thing, Laura. Like, well, for you, what will be one dream project or dream situation for churches, but you, you know, in your area to, and, and it can be as unrealistic or out there <laughs> as, as, because it is good to have these kind of challenges eventually, yeah, you know, to, to, to have something to, to aspire for and, and go for. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about something that's very realistic and very basic. I think every community board, every neighborhood should have a climate resilience plan. And that can look similar and different across communities. Um, but my organization organized 400 people in four neighborhoods to develop a climate resilience plan for Northern Manhattan. And in that plan, we prioritized energy justice because we understood that when there are brownouts in the city, and we've all probably been through them, um, they hit communities of color and low income the worst. And so we have embarked on solar installations in the um, least affordable housing in our community, starting with what they call HDFCs, which are low income tenant owned cooperatives. Because when we talk about fighting gentrification, part of the way to do that is by keeping housing affordable. And those utility costs are what drive up the cost uh, of housing. And so thinking about extreme heat, if you're in a neighborhood with a lot of 
with a high uh, percentage of senior citizens uh, and children uh, who are going to be very susceptible. You know, thousands of people die prematurely every day, because, every year, because of extreme heat. And so thinking about the rain that comes when we've had two days of rain and the subway was out, you know, that affected everybody in New York City. So how do we begin to think about a resilience plan for the Upper West Side? And how would your church be involved in that and the other churches and synagogues that are in this neighborhood? How would you all come together and think about emergency communications, uh, emergency planning? Um, so I think that that um, might not be a grand vision, um, but it is a basic one that does not exist, that we could all come together around. And like Peggy, I'm going to stay very much rooted in the practical, because uh, Peggy and I have both seen change made by figuring out what you can engineer as an activist, what you can develop the collaborations around to get done what's possible, what we have the technology for, and what we have the drive for, and what we have the passion for. And there is a law that was passed in New York City three-ish years ago, which is often referred to as Local Law 97. It is the most progressive buildings decarbonization law in the nation. And it is going to be one of the biggest challenges to fully implement of any climate law. And there's that old song, if we can make it here, we'll make it anywhere. If we can decarbonize our buildings in New York City, what a wonderful example it will be for others who are doubters. So I'm going to send uh, Pastor Andrew the link, which I was just looking up, to Local Law 97, and maybe we can figure out ways to collaborate to support this very important law and get it to succeed. Thank you, that's, okay. that's very great. And uh, we will have after the service, after the final hallelujah or in blessing, uh, uh, we will like to invite you to stay where you are after postlude and we'll have question and answer and also over the uh, internet, we will move you a little bit so that you can see them there. Uh, and there might be question coming uh, from Zoom. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing the vision, sharing your expertise, and sharing your care for our broader community and for this city, which is also, in its essence, the care for the entire world. Because we cannot care for the entire world, but as you are constantly pulling us back, or pulling me back, <laughs> to uh, that care which we can enact in the place where we are. And thank you very much for that. Uh